Welcome to Epler's Church, United Church of Christ, where no matter who you are or where you are on life's journey, you are welcome here with us this morning. A few brief announcements before we begin our worship. Uh, this morning we are trying something a little bit different. Uh, well, we're trying a lot of things different these days, but um, we are actually streaming our service live right now. So those who are on Facebook can actually join us right now in real time. Um, assuming the Wi-Fi stays connected, the phone doesn't fall down, and all things technology work, uh, people will continue to be able to join us. Uh, so we want to welcome those who are uh, joining us virtually this morning. Following our service, that live stream will then also be available on Facebook. Uh, should someone not have been able to join us live, they can check that out later. Uh, I am wear keeping my mask off because I am far enough away from you, and I appreciate everyone has been uh, doing a great job of sitting far enough apart and um, keeping your masks on or your shields and whatever it is that you need to, to stay healthy today. One announcement, th this week on uh, Friday, um, Saturday, Friday, you may have received an email from the church. It was from me, or supposedly from me, asking for a gift card to be purchased. That did not come from me. That did not come from the church. Uh, we were hacked through our church email and are remedying that situation, uh, but please disregard that email. Uh, once I was aware of the situation, I did send out an e-blast to alert everyone, uh, but I also appreciate I got three text messages, two phone calls, and an email within like a three-minute period. So. Uh, people are, are keeping us uh, on our toes. The only other announcement uh, is that this morning we are going to be having communion. Uh, I hope you brought your communion elements with you. If you did not, uh, when you go home, we will have blessed those elements from afar and you can partake when you get home. Because when you are present here, your body, your mind, and your spirit are present with us as well. Next Sunday, uh, we will be posting a video that the Pennsylvania Southeast Conference ministry staff has put together. Uh, it is a way to give us pastors a little bit of a break from leading worship and trying to find these uh, new ways of, of being church. So uh, I encourage you next Sunday to check out that video. Uh, I will still be working all week and then next Sunday evening at 6.30, we are going to have a parking lot party, uh, which is basically a gathering of folks who would like to come, speak with each other. We're going to kind of have a rotating basis and be kind of hiding behind the building here so that the, uh, the traffic doesn't bother our conversations. Um, there is also going to be ice cream. So if you'd like to join us next week at 630 in the evening next Sunday for some ice cream, some fellowship, please do that as well. Let us now turn our hearts and our minds toward God as we begin our morning worship.
Let us be in a spirit of prayer together. Compassionate one, lover of goodness, patience with sinners, draw near to us. Surround us with confidence in your good news, that you love us as parents love their children, that your mercy is boundless and generous, that you beckon us always and will wait forever as we find our way back to you. Open our hearts to receive your compassion, and then show us how to forgive, so that we may be vessels of resurrection hope in our troubled world. In Jesus' name, amen. Let us be in a spirit of prayer and confession. O Holy One, we come to you asking to be forgiven, and we know that your grace allows us to love. However, we sometimes forget to forgive others. Help us to be loving people especially those that may have wronged us. Help us also to be a people that will truly repentant and ask for forgiveness from others. We are imperfect people, but we are also given the grace and love of God. Be with us, O Holy One, to support us in our tasks for love compassion, and the sharing of your spirit. Amen. We are called to forgive others. And through the forgiveness and the grace of God and the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, we are all a forgiven people. Thanks be to God. Amen. A reading from Romans, chapter 14, verses 1 through 12. Welcome those who are weak in faith, 
but not for the purpose of quarreling over opinions. Some believe in eating anything, while the weak eat only vegetables. Those who eat must not despise those who abstain, and those who abstain must not pass judgment on those who eat, for God has welcomed them. Who are you to pass judgment on servants of another? It is before their own Lord that they stand or fall, and they will be upheld, for the Lord is able to make them stand. Some judge one day to be better than another, while others judge all days to be alike. Let all be fully convinced in their own minds. Those who observe the day observe it in honor of the Lord, and those who eat, eat in honor of the Lord. Also, since they give thanks to God, while those who abstain, abstain in honor of the Lord and give thanks to God. We do not live to ourselves, and we do not die to ourselves. If we live, we live to the Lord, and if we die, we die to the Lord. So then, whether we live or whether we die, we are the Lord's. For to this end Christ died and lived again, so that he might be Lord of both the dead and the living. Why do you pass judgment on your brother or sister? Or you, why do you despise your brother or sister? For we will all stand before the judgment seat of God. For it is written, as I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess praise to God. So then, each of us will be accountable to God. And a reading from Matthew, chapter 18, verses 21 through 35. Then Peter came and said to him, Lord, if another member of the church sins against me, how often should I forgive? As many as seven times? Jesus said to him, not seven times, but I tell you 77 times. For this reason, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his slaves. When he began the reckoning, one who owed him 10,000 talents was brought to him. And as he could not pay, his Lord ordered him to be sold, together with his wife and children and all his possessions, and payments to be made. So the slave fell on his knees before him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will pay you everything. And out of pity for him, the Lord of that slave released him and forgave him the debt. But that same slave, as he went out, came upon one of his fellow slaves, who owed him a hundred denarii. And seizing him by the throat, he said, Pay what you owe. Then his fellow slave fell down and pleaded with him, Have patience with me, and I will pay you. But he refused. Then he went and threw him into prison until he would pay the debt. When his fellow slaves saw what had happened, they were greatly distressed. And they went and reported to their Lord all that had taken place. Then his Lord summoned him and said to him, You wicked slave, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. Should you not have had mercy on your fellow slave as I had mercy on you? And in anger, his Lord handed him over to be tortured until he would pay his entire debt. So my heavenly Father will also do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother or sister from your heart. Let us pray. 
May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable to you, our rock, our redeemer. Amen. Well, the gospel lesson this morning gives us an interesting story about forgiveness. How often are we supposed to forgive? Who should we be forgiving? And how does our acts of forgiveness or not forgiving compare to God's offer to us through God's wonderful and immeasurable grace? <clears throat> The scripture passage is really broken down into two sections. The first section is that of Peter speaking to Jesus and asking the question, how, how often should we forgive? Seven times? Jesus answers, not seven, but seven times seven or 77 times, depending on which translation you are reading. But, you know, the translation of the numbers really, it really doesn't matter. What matters is that the number of times is large enough that we don't need to even count it. You see, forgiveness, it does not need a number. It needs faith. It needs compassion. And it needs love. It needs the idea that nothing should be counted. There is, there is more to life than counting how many times we should forgive someone. We need to take the time to be forgiving so that we can also be forgiven. So this brings us to the second part of our gospel. This parable, this, this book of Matthew is, is full of parables. And this parable is that of a king or a, a lord with a servant who has a large debt. Now, I don't want to get too technical about the historical numbers and what re it re represents in dollars today. But what is important to note is that the king's servant had a debt that had grown to such a large amount that it just could not have been paid in his lifetime or even his family's lifetime. But even in this immeasurable debt, because of the way that the servant asked for a little bit of mercy, the king decided to forgive the servant everything that he owed. The king realized that it wouldn't make much of a difference anyway. That debt was so large that even if the servant were sent to jail or the whole family were sold back into slavery that he wouldn't make up that money anyway. So that king, he became a forgiving man and he let the servant go. Now we find the king to be compassionate here and even the servant is very thankful. But then we continue with this story and we find the servant going along and finding a fellow slave, a, a colleague, if you will, who owed this first slave some money. It was a much smaller amount. It would have been easy to be paid back. But the man who was forgiven by the king does not forgive his colleague. Now all of this back and forth and talking about servants and slaves and lords and kings, I read this scripture over and over and over again this week because it really can be confusing as to who is who throughout this story. So I even wondered kind of out loud, who, who is the good guy in this story? Who is, who, who is the, the good person? Well... There, there, there's a little hint that I have to tell you that there is a good person at, at the end. If this were a movie, we would know that the good person wins. In this situation, the good person is God, and the good person is also us. It was funny, when I was writing this sermon, I was thinking about 
uh, when we'd have children's time and I'd ask the kids a, a question, something about the Bible story, and nine out of ten times, if the, if the kids said Jesus or God, that was the correct answer. And in some ways, that's partly the case today as well. Because the story does have a happy ending. But it doesn't come without us looking through it, reading into it, and thinking about it. So the king finds out that the servant that he forgave has not been so compassionate with someone who owes him some money. So the king calls this first servant back, even after forgiving him and letting him go free, and he reprimands him. The king tells him, since I had mercy on you, why did you not have mercy on him? So the next verse, has the king throw the servant in jail anyway? We know that this would be impossible, an amount to pay back, but throwing the servant in jail is what this king does in his disappointment and his anger. It is more to the point that this servant should really learn and understand that his lack of compassion and forgiveness is truly a problem. Now I said before that this story, it does, it does have a happy ending. It is not that the man ends up in jail after he was mean to a fellow servant. It is that this story represents for us a short lesson in forgiveness and grace. It is to say that God will be a forgiving, loving being because the grace of God does not need to be paid back. We should be loving to each other because God is loving us. Well, the final verse says, God will forgive you as long as you forgive others from your heart. Well, this is the good news. This is the happy ending. And, and this is that grace that, that Jesus is constantly talking about. And here we see this compassion that God has for us all. But in this passage, there is this, this stipulation that we must forgive others with our hearts, with our whole hearts, in order for us to be forgiven as well. There is a call to forgiveness in this passage. We are called to a way of life that allows us to know that in our forgiveness of others, that is how we can see God's forgiveness for ourselves. Now, we aren't supposed to just forgive others for the sake of saying, I forgive you, but that it is a change that happens within us and a change that can happen in the relationship between those two people. Now, our spiritual lives are not a quid pro quo. God does not give us something because we give something back to God. Even in this passage that God requires the forgiveness of others before God will forgive us, I, I struggle with this thinking. Because the grace that God has for us is not a cheap grace. The grace that God has for us is seen in the love as God sends his son Jesus Christ to die on the cross. The grace that God has can be seen in the memory of the memorial meal that we are going to be partaking together. The grace that God has for us is explained through scriptures as that of a loving God who even in stories like this where the king becomes angry, we know that God is not a hateful, vengeful God who brings down punishment upon us. God is the God of love. Our God is the God of grace. Our God is the God of forgiveness. 
Now, God does not treat us nicely because we treat others nicely. But we can have some emotional comfort and relationship building when we forgive others. Think about how you may have felt the last time you forgave someone. Most of us feel pretty good about that. It is in those moments that God is working through you to be compassionate and loving. And that is how God treats us with compassion and love and care. Now the point of this passage is not necessarily how many times we should forgive someone, but how, how much that forgiveness can be life-changing. If my friend fights with me or lies to me 50 times, I am called to forgive him or her. It isn't about the numbers that it happened 50 times. It is about the forgiveness. It is about the compassion and the grace and the building up of relationship. As I was preparing uh, the worship service for this week, I came to the point where I was writing up the liturgy for our communion service. And I realized as I was writing that up that it has been since the beginning of March that we have been able to commune as one church family. Today we are also trying our, our live stream and I'm hoping that folks who happen to be watching right now will also gather their communion elements so that even if they are not sitting here with us on this church grounds, that they and we can feel the presence of Christ together. We can commune. We can be in worship as one body of Christ. When we have special moments, like communion, we can feel that presence. It is the working together and have, having these moments that makes our life better. It is the coming to God with our whole hearts, forgiven of sin and being full of God's grace. It is that when we forgive our brothers and sisters, we can be changed. And when God forgives us, we can feel the change throughout our entire beings. What matters is that as we come to the table, as we come together as, as people of God, that we are blessed beyond measure. We are a forgiven people. We are a forgiving people. We are loved by God, and that love has no boundaries. May you find that loving your neighbor is easy because God loved you first. And that God continues to love you. May you find that forgiving others can be comforting because you can feel better inside and build those relationships with those people and with God. And may we all find support and love in not only the love and forgiveness of God, but in each other through worship and time, whether we are gathered or whether we are scattered that we recognize and feel the power and presence of God today, tomorrow, and always. Amen.
We are going to come before God for a time of prayer. And I'd like to uh, lift up um, Gwen Lakowski, who is currently at Reading Hospital. Uh, she had a fall uh, this week um, and did have a slight fracture of her uh, arm. Uh, so we want to lift up Gwen. Uh, we want to continue to lift up Brian Folk uh, and his family everything that he's going through with his health issues. Um, and we are just, uh, and also, uh, that was the other, uh, Geraldine Coke, Brian's mom, is also in the hospital. Uh, so we want to lift up uh, all of those people that we continue to lift up on our prayer list, those who are going through uh, many different issues, uh, health issues, uh, as well as their families, as they care and love about their loved ones. Let us be in a spirit of prayer together. O Holy One, we come this morning grateful to be together again in worship and praise. We ask for blessings upon those who cannot be with us today and ask that you will offer your loving hands, wrapping yourself around them all. We lift up to you many things that are on our hearts this day. We lift up those who are dealing with natural disasters and cleanup from hurricanes, from fires, and from flooding. We ask that we can be used as your hands and feet to continue the service to the world. We continue to pray for all of the students, teachers, and staff that are working to educate our children and those in colleges around the world as everyone is attempting to make the best decisions possible for safety and education. We know many people who are dealing with health issues this day. We lift up to you now the names of those that are especially, that we are especially concerned for, including Scott Wales, and Joanne and Ted, Jay Kleinfelter and Mary Angie Schell, Joanne McLean and Lewis and Ruth Ann Disk, Megan Quick and Cheryl Hanahoe, John Alderman and Kristen Kemery, Randy Straub and Kevin Hefty, Joe and Mary Ann, Sandra Gargantio and Lisa Oakes, Heather Yuzinski and Linda Lesher, John Bachman, James O'Rourke, and Linda Bachman. Scott Arndt and Mary Ann Blyer. Lori Haupt and Alyssa Peck. Brian Folk, Ryan Nechtel. Gwen Lakowski and Geraldine Folk. We also lift up to you first responders and doctors and nurses, especially Paige and Danielle and Pete Lakowski. And we continue to pray for the men and women serving in our armed forces. May they all be kept safe, whether they are serving here at home or on foreign soil. We ask that you will hear us now as we join our voices together, praying the prayer that your son taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. I'm going to begin our communion liturgy now, and there is a space uh, where we will all get our communion elements uh, ready together. Uh, so you will, you will have a few moments uh, in, just, in just a little bit. Beloved in Christ, the gospel tells us that on the first day of the week, Jesus Christ was raised from death, appeared to Mary Magdalene. On that same day, sat at the table with two disciples, and was made known to them in the breaking of the bread. 
This is the joyful feast of the people of God. Men and women, youth and children, come from the east and the west, from the north and the south, and gather about Christ's table. This table is for all people who wish to know the presence of Christ and to share in the community of God's people. Let us pray. We give you thanks, Holy One, Almighty and eternal God, always and forever, through Jesus Christ, the only one begotten by you before all time, by whom you made the world and all things. We bless you for your continual love and care for every creature. We praise you for forming us in your image and for calling us to be your people. Although we rebel against your love, you do not abandon us in our sin, but sent to us prophets and teachers to lead us into the way of salvation. Above all, we give you thanks for the gift of Jesus, our only Savior, who is the way and the truth and the life. In the fullness of time, you came to us and received our nature in the person of Jesus, who, in obedience to you, by suffering on the cross and being raised from the dead, deliver us from the way of sin and death. We praise you that Jesus now reigns with you in glory and ever lives to pray for us. And we thank you for the Holy Spirit who leads us into truth, defends us in adversity, and gathers us from every people to unite us in one holy church. Amen. We remember that on the night of betrayal and desertion and on the eve of death, Jesus gathered his disciples for the feast of Passover. And he took bread and he broke it. And he gave it to the disciples and he said, take and eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And after supper, he also took the cup. And he said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it, in remembrance of me. Let us pray. Eternal God, we unite in this covenant of faith, recalling Christ's suffering and death, rejoicing in Christ's resurrection, and awaiting Christ's return in victory. We spread your table with these gifts of the earth and of our labor. We present to you our very lives committed to your service in behalf of all people. We ask you to send your Holy Spirit on these gifts of bread and juice and wine on our gifts and on us. Strengthen your universal church that it may be the champion of peace and justice in all the world, and restore the earth with your grace that is able to make all things new. Be present with us as we share this meal and throughout all our lives that we may know you as the Holy One who with Christ and the Holy Spirit lives forever. Amen. You may get your elements ready. As you continue to get things ready, hear these words. The body of Christ, broken for you. And the blood of Christ, poured out for you. The body of Christ, 
take and eat. In the blood of Christ shed for you, take and drink. As you put your things away, he hear this prayer and let us be in a spirit of prayer of thanksgiving. Almighty God, we give you thanks for the gift of our Savior's presence in presence, in the simplicity and splendor of this holy meal. Unite us with all who are fed by Christ's body and blood, that we may faithfully proclaim the good news of your love, and that your universal church may be a rainbow of hope in an uncertain world, through Jesus Christ, our Redeemer. Amen. Before our benediction, I want to uh, thank the congregation as you have continued to financially support uh, the work of this church. Uh, if you do have an offering today, you may place it in the offering basket, uh, the offering plate over there. Uh, this congregation is truly blessed to have so many wonderful people who are continually uh, giving and continually working together. Uh, as we have meetings, as we continue the work of consistory, uh, different boards that are meeting and, and people who are still connecting with each other, talking to each other, calling each other. Uh, it, it is truly a blessing to be a part of this congregation. And uh, I hope that as we continue to hopefully get back to some type of normalcy, uh, that we will continue with this work being together and staying connected as a church family. And now may you all go in peace, in light of the forgiving God, who not only forgives us, but teaches us and guides us in our time of forgiveness. And may the Lord bless you and keep you. May God's face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May God lift up his countenance upon you and bring you peace. Amen.